So let let me let me start. Um, so Pedro Vieira is a professor at uh, Perimeter Institute Canada and also ICTP Safer and EFT UNESP. And he has won uh, prizes such as the Gribov Medal and the New Horizons Prize. And he works with exact solutions of gauge theories and string theory, uh, bootstrap, integrability, and so on. And today he is going to talk about quantum spin chains, right? So yes. please, Pedro, uh, with the word. Okay, thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm happy that there are so many people online. It's really quite a success. So congratulations. Um, so I'm going to give a Blackboard talk. I always try to give Blackboard talks. So it's not going to be an exception. And uh, I'll try to create a little bit of chaos from the beginning. So I, I took a screenshot. So First of all, I encourage people to keep their cameras on. I think it's much funnier if I can see people and if I can see people nodding and so on. And I think the internet survives completely well. There's no issue with having the camera on. So I don't know. I, I would prefer to see people and to see if, if what I'm saying makes sense and to see if people are rolling their eyes and saying, oh, he's crazy, or um, if instead uh, uh, people are following. And uh, do ask questions at any point. Don't don't wait until the end. Or just uh, either unmute yourself or ask the chairman, whatever. But uh, do ask questions during the talk. And um, as I said, I'm going to give a Blackboard talk where I'll tell you a little bit about this uh, object that uh, are called uh, spin chains. OK. So, so we are going to discuss, uh, oops. Spin chains. And uh, um, so, what is a, a spin chain? So, first of all, let's remember what is a spin. So, a spin is a discrete degree of freedom, right? It's a very quantum mechanical thing. And we can imagine having a spin at a given point. And the simplest possible spin would be what we call a spin one half. So that's the simplest possible spin. It's a spin that can be up or down. Okay. And so uh, a spin that, uh, that can be up or down, we would say that the Hilbert space for a single spin would be just spanned by either the spin is pointing up, like the electron is spinning clockwise, or the spin is pointing down, the electron would be spinning counterclockwise. And so you see that there are two possibilities. So this is a very simple quantum mechanical system. To specify the system, you just say how much is up and how much is down, right? So a generic state would be psi, which would be a combination of up and a combination of down, a little bit of up, a little bit of down. And so, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, there's nothing more to describe. If I have just uh, one, uh, one spin, what else would we say? We say it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space. There are two possibilities, right? So what is these two dimensions? These two is just because we are doing spin one half. So this is two times this one half plus one in general, that the generacy is 2j plus 1, where j is the spin, right? And uh, this is equal to 2 in this, right? So this is thus the usual degeneracy, which is just 2j plus 1, and j here is 1 half. And so we have this spin up, this spin down. Here we have a quantum superposition of two states. So this would be the simplest possible quantum superposition. So a quantum state, a combination of these two states. And what would be a quantum system to specify completely the quantum system? This is the kinematics, if you want. This is the Hilbert space. What would be the Hamiltonian? Well, the Hamiltonian depends on your system, right? I mean, uh, maybe there's no Hamiltonian or everyone has zero energy. Or maybe, for example, there is 
the, the moments want to be aligned in the Z direction. So this here, I'm writing an example. So for example, it could be some magnetic moment times the spin component Z, for example. And this would say that if the spin is up, if mu is positive and the spin is up, this has energy mu. If spin is down, it has energy minus mu. So if mu is positive, the spin wants to be down, right? If mu is positive. Okay, so, so this is not yet a spin chain. This is a rather one spin, right? So, and, uh, and if it is just one spin, uh, there's not much more we can say, except of course, what I already anticipated by words. So let's write it here with a different color, that if instead I would generalize this to spin J, right? Then here, there would be J. So the dimension would be to J plus one. And the this J, this, uh, this Hilbert space would be spanned by, uh, in that case, I could say that I start from minus J, minus J plus one, dot, 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 all the way to J. And this would be the two J plus one dimensional space. And this would be a spin J. Okay. And that's it. Now, what, uh, what do we have when we have two spins? So one spin, we are done. But when we have two spins, now we have something more interesting. Now I have one spin. And we have a neighboring spin. Right. And now the spins can form, so I have uh, now the Hilbert space, which is, let's write, let's remember it's two dimensional. We can say it was the first two dimensional Hilbert space, C2, this A and B, the two complex numbers. Tensor with another two dimensional Hilbert space, another C2 for the second spin. So now our Hilbert space is four dimensional. And this four dimensional is equal to what? This four dimensional is equal to three plus one, where these three is the two spins can form a triplet. And this one is they can form a singlet. Right? In other words, when we have this Hilbert space, we can say that this Hilbert space is spanned by there is a state which is a singlet, up, down, minus, down, up, over square root of two. This would be the singlet. And then there are three states that are the triplet, which you can say it's up, up, down, down, and up, down, plus, down, up, over square root of two. And these guys here would be the triplet. So in total, there are four states. And it's convenient to write them as the as to separate them into the triplet and the single. Now, how do we tell if uh, so? Now, when we write linear combinations of states, now I have these two spins, and you see that these two spins now I can couple them. Now we can start. Okay. Now. We can start building a chain by coupling them. Now we can couple them. We can say there is an interaction energy that will couple these two spins. So how do we write an interaction between two spins? So we have one spin. Let me use this Pauli matrix to indicate spin at position one, right? This would act on this C2. And then we have the spin at position two, this would act on this second C2. Right? And we can now generate an interaction by writing, for example, an interaction could be the total spin. So let's write sigma one plus sigma two squared. Just the, this would be just the total spin. Is 
Is this clear? That's the total spin between the two spins. And the total spin can be what? I add spin one half plus spin one half, I can get spin zero or spin one, right? You remember from adding angular momentum, right? So if I have one half plus one half, I can have spin one and spin zero. This is exactly the triplet. And this guy zero is exactly the same. So, so everything so far is totally, I think it should be clear for you, right? That uh, I'm not saying anything yet new, but uh, now I'm hope I will probably start writing things that are not so familiar to most of you. So, so let me remember again. So we are having the total spin. We wrote an interaction that is that that measures the total spin. So this total spin interaction is just, as we said, there is some coupling, let's call it lambda, some measuring the strength of the interaction, and then spin at position one plus spin at position two squared. Right? So I remind you that if it was just one spin, this is thought, this is just this just gives me the spin of one particle square, which is just one half, right? So I remind you that this sigma here, this would be the Pauli matrices. So it would be something like sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. Maybe let's put a one half because it's a spin, right? Spin plus one half and minus one half just for normalization purposes. Then uh, you see that sigma, if these are the, the three sigmas, right? This is sigma component A, this would be the first component, A equal X and so on. Then a sigma square, which would be the sum of sigma A square. is just each of these matrices squares to one quarter. So it just gives me one quarter. Each of them gives the same thing, three times each of them gives the identity matrix, right? And uh, let me remind you that this is okay because this is just the total spin. This is just, you see, J times J plus one. This is just the Casimir of SU2 times the identity matrix where j equal to one half, right? So it works, right? One half, one half plus one is three halves. So one half times three halves is three quarters. Okay, so this is one spin. So one spin, the total spin operator is totally boring. It's just the identity. It just measures the spin of the operator. But what's interesting is that when we have two spins now, when I have lambda, times spin at position one plus spin at position two. This is equal to, if I square this, the sigma one square and sigma two square is boring. It is just the three quarters times uh, lambda times the identity. This happens twice, so times two. So this would be just the sigma square plus twice lambda sigma at position one dot sigma at position two. And this is the usual spin-spin interaction. So the usual spin-spin interaction, spin-spin coupling, you can say that up to a trivial constant, up to this trivial constant here, is just measuring the total spin. So it's the, it's, it's the total spin minus some boring constant, this spin-spin interaction, right? And so let's copy this and continue on the next slide. And so we just learned that on the one hand, we have that this object here. So what do we learn? We learn that uh, lambda times, let's write the spin-spin interaction in that usual way, just the scalar product between the two spins. 
spin at site one dot spin at position two, the spin two, right? This would be equal to minus three lambda over four times the identity plus lambda over two times the total spin. What's the total spin? The total spin will be zero times zero plus one if the state is in a singlet for the singlet, right? Acting on the singlet, it gives this. And acting on the triplet gives me one times one plus one acting on the triplet, just measuring the total spin. Right? Zero times zero plus one is one. This number is this number here is two. And so we conclude that the result gives me lambda if I am, I project into the triplet state. And if I am in the singlet, the last term doesn't give me anything. And then there is the identity. Sorry, I wrote a mistake. So I, give, I get lambda, but the identity also contributes. So I get lambda minus three quarters of lambda. So I get lambda over four times if I'm in the singlet. And if I'm in the triplet, if I'm in the triplet, sorry. And if I'm in the singlet, only the first term contributes minus three lambda over four times the projector into the singlet. Of course, the projector into the triplet plus the projector into the singlet is equal to the identity. It's the same as doing now. Because if I uh, right, project in the, there are only two possibilities. So I can always write one of them as an identity minus the other projector. So what, what I want to point out is that this kind of interaction is therefore the same up to an overall constant as just projecting into, for example, the triple. Okay. Now, <clears throat> and uh, okay. So that's one way of understanding the, this interaction. <clears throat> and therefore, what does this interaction, let's uh, copy this expression again here. So, um, do I want to copy this? Maybe not. Okay, maybe. Um, Oh yeah, why not? Yeah. And so So here is an example of a spin-spin interaction. And now we can construct a spin chain. We can say, I have a chain, which is just a collection of spins that couple to each other, that each spin couples to the two neighboring spins. So there is a coupling between these two spins and between these two spins, right? And now let's write, a general spin chain Hamiltonian for what we call nearest, so when we only interact with the neighbors, so nearest neighbor interaction, right? So what would it be? So at each side, we have some Hilbert space for some uh, group G. In the example we have done before was SU2 spin one half. So we have some representation J of some group G. So it was the fundamental representation plus minus spin of spin one half in our example, right? 
So when we make this representation, J tensor J, we get a sum of a bunch of other representations, uh, J tilde. In our example, J tilde was singlet and triplet, right? But a priori, I could have, for example, if it's spin one with one, if it was spin one, what could I have? Spin two or um, spin one or spin zero, right? So when we multiply higher spins, spins goes up from the difference up to the sum, right? And so we have a bunch of sum representations and that's for SU2. I could do SU3. Now I have two representations of SU3. I fuse them and I decompose into a sum of representations of SU3. Right? Now, what would be then my Hamiltonian? Now my Hamiltonian would be the following. I sum, I go around the spin chain from I equal to one up to the number of sides of the spin chain. One, two, three, four, etc., until the last one L. And then uh, I have some Hamiltonian density, some interaction that couples spins I and I plus one. And that's my spin chain Hamiltonian. And what would be this spin chain Hamiltonian? What would be this interaction? If I want my spin, my interaction to preserve the symmetry that uh, I have, for example, to preserve SU2 symmetry, the rotation of the spins, like we did for total spin, this interaction between spin i and i plus one should be just a sum over all these representations that I get j tilde, projector into j tilde. That's the example, like the example I wrote about. And then some numbers, C, that depend on J tilde. And these are just numbers. So an example is SU2 spin one half, spin spin interaction. So an example, this is a simplest example is just what we said, lambda times sigma at position i coupled with spin at position i plus one. Right? This is a linear combination of projected into singlet and triplet. It preserves the SU2 symmetry, right? I have some states, they form multiplets and uh, I can either be in singlet or triplet. But in general, if you have a general group, you can put, say, for example, some SU3 spin chain. At each side of my spin chain, I have an adjoint representation of SU3. A joint times a joint gives me a bunch of representations. Your spin chain Hamiltonian will be a sum of the projectors into each representation with a different number multiplying each projector. Okay. So this, this would be our definition of what is called a spin chain Hamiltonian. for any group G, any representation, provided its nearest neighbors and preserves the symmetry of the group. Excuse me, professor, can I ask, uh, interrupt of you? Of course. Uh, you started with the ansatz of uh, interaction that would be a sum of uh, the sigmas from neighboring spins, right? Yes. Uh, squared. Yes. If, for example, you, make it uh, to the fourth power, would it change anything? Because right. it will so, preserve, right? The, the so symmetry. it would not change anything. So let, let's see uh, about, uh, let, let's see what would happen. So what okay. happens is that uh, if you have uh, any power of Pauli matrix square, you get identity, right? So when you raise it to the power four, any term where Pauli matrices appear raised to a power bigger than two, if they are raised, if a Pauli matrix is raised to an odd power, that is just the same as power one because two powers is the okay. Identity. Okay, okay. So, what okay. is the mathematical statement then? The mathematical statement is that in the product of two spin one half, all I can do is either form a singlet or a triplet. Okay, okay. so that's it. So, Fair. the only degree of freedom I have is am I in a singlet or am I in a triplet? Fair enough, so, thank you. But that's an excellent question. So, so let, let's build then our first examples. 
of spin chains. So example. The simplest one is exactly what we said, which is the group G is SU2. The representation J is just spin one half. Then, as we said, the Hamiltonian will be just the sum of some number lambda times spin at position i dot spin at position i plus one. And there is nothing else I can write. If I try to write the square of this scalar product, this is a scalar product, right? It preserves SU2 symmetry by definition. If I square it, I do nothing because the square of this is the identity. If I cube it, it's the same as just one power. Yeah, so there is only one. And this is nothing, as I said, this is nothing, but this is equivalent. To a sum of the two projectors into triplet and singlet of some number CJ times projector into triplet and singlet. Okay. Now, a different example would be G equals still SU2, but for example, J equal to spin one. Right? Now, if I have spin one, my spin matrices are not Pauli matrices, but now I have a sigma Z, sigma plus and sigma minus or sigma Z, sigma X and sigma minus that are three dimensional, right? So this, so the Hilbert space now, is a product of three dimensional Hilbert spaces. How many copies? To the power of the length of the spin chain. Right? But each of them now has dimension three. Two J plus one is three. Right? And now when I multiply two spin ones, right? When I multiply two spin ones, I can get spin zero, spin one, or spin two. Right? And so the sum of the three projectors, it's a boring constant, I don't care. But because I can get three, there will be two structures I can write, right? There is two structures plus the identity. So if you want identity and two structures, what are they? Well, they are exactly what we said. So the Hamiltonian now would be a sum of the Hamiltonian density. So sum over I, sum over I, and then the Hamiltonian density I can write now, as I said, as a sum of the spin can be zero, one, or two, some numbers, CJ times projector into that representation that projects spin I and spin I plus one into that representation, right? Now, this is a sum of three terms, but as I said, only two terms because the sum of the three projectors is the identity. So up to a trivial identity shift, it, there are two terms. So what are these two terms? If I want to write it in more conventional terms, I can say, as I said, it's A times the identity, a number times the identity. Okay, let me use, let me for numbers not use this funny letter, let me use like this, A times the identity, plus B times the product of two spins. Let me write spin at position I dot spin at position I plus one, right? But now for spin one, the term that you were proposing is uh, not trivially related, but I have spin i dot spin i plus one square. Now for spin one, this this one is not just the identity. Right? And so now I can write this, but the next power is trivial. The next power now would be trivial. For spin one, it stops here. And so on. And it increases more and more as I go to more spin. And so this guy is boring. I don't care about the constant shift of the Hamiltonian, right? Overall normalization is boring. So here, what matters is C over B. So different Hamiltonians have different C over B. The overall constant is not important. That's just rescaling all energies by the same amount. But what does matter is what is the ratio between these two couplings? And this will give me a different spin chain. Okay. And actually, it's quite interesting that these guys, 
there is very different physics depending on this B over C. Okay. So there, there is really a very rich, if I call this guy lambda, no, not lambda, okay, why not? Lambda, there is a rich phase space diagram, phase space, uh, phase diagram as a function of this lambda. Depending on lambda, our vacuum can be gap, not gap. Uh, it can uh, the description of what the vacuum is can be very much depending on this ratio. Now, um, uh, right. You see, there are. Let me just write another example, just for those that uh, suppose I did the G equal S U two. Okay. Let me do another example. Let me say G is equal to an orthogonal group S O N and the and the vector representation. The representation would be the vector representation at each position. So at each position, I have a vector. V I where I runs from one up to N. Right? I have N component, an N component vector at each position. What can we do with two vectors? With two vector representations, what's the product of two vector representations? Right? This we learn when we learn tensors, right? When I have two vectors, what can I form? I can form when I have two different vectors. I can form an anti-symmetric combination, right? So now in the product of this vector tensor with vector, when I have two spins, each of them is a vector, right? I have a vector at each position of my spin. I can form a singlet, which is just like contracting, making the scalar product of the two vectors. I can form uh, an anti symmetric combination. That would be like a V1, V2 minus V2, V1. And I can form a symmetric traceless combination. Okay. This is nothing but a statement that if I have a map from two vectors to two vectors, right? It means that my Hamiltonian density that acts on indices i and i plus one, it takes two vectors. A with indices A, B, and gives me two vectors with index C, D, right? And what can I write when I have this SON vector, this tensor? I must write it into the invariant tensors of SON, which are just Kronecker deltas, right? So what can I write? The only things I can write are some constant A times some Kronecker delta like this, delta A, B, delta C, D plus some constant B delta C delta BD, plus some constant C delta AB delta BC. So there are only three things I could write, which are exactly in one-to-one -one with the three representations. The three representations are that linear combinations of this ABC, right? I just, uh, in the same way with two spins, I can also either symmetrize or anti-symmetrize, and the two combinations will be the singlet and the triplet. Okay, so that's how we see that there are three structures. Okay. And so <clears throat> all spin chains that have S O N symmetry will be equal if they are nearest neighbors again, or S O N doesn't matter. The summation from I equal one up to L. And then uh, there will be A times the projector into the singlet plus small b. This A, B, C are not the same as the A, B, C of these three structures. They are linear combinations. B times the projector into the anti-symmetric plus C times the projector into the symmetric trace. And then again, what matters is the ratio between these two. Or the, what matters are the ratios. I can fix one of them to be the identity, right? Because I can always write that the sum of projectors equal the identity, same story. And then the ratios between them would matter. 
No. <clears throat> then we ask, okay, so we have this spin chain and uh, you see that the, the, fir the first obvious comment is that these spin chains, the Hilbert space, let me make a few comments about this spin chain. So first spin chain is that the Hilbert space is huge, right? really huge, I should put many years. It, it, it's really huge because it's a finite dimension at each side. Right? So even for SU2, which is the smallest one, even for SU2, right, the dimension of the Hilbert space would be two possibilities for each of the sides. So it's, it's always exponentially large, right? If it's the vector representation of dimension n, it's n to the alpha, right? So we have this huge Hilbert space. And so solving this Hamiltonian, so my Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian of the spin chain is a matrix which is of dimension two to the L times two to the L matrix. Okay, and that means we can solve the spin chains in a computer up to length equal 12, basically. Length bigger than 12, forget. I mean, maybe if you buy a big cluster and you spend a few million dollars, you can do 13. Okay, but um, okay, but 14, no one can do. And so you have this uh, you have this problem that okay I can solve these spin chains if I go up to some reasonable length. And now there is this small problem which is in condensed matter, for example, uh, we want L, I mean to be 10 to the many, right? You want to have a big spin chain. So this would be like some chain of molecules for some, some material that would be a one dimensional chain. And it's much bigger than 12. So it's a big challenge. How do we tame this exponential? How do we extract physics out of these spin chains? How do I compute even the simplest possible quantities in this spin chain? So what would be the simplest thing? Like what is the lowest energy state? What's the vacuum? Right? Even the vacuum is very complicated to compute in general in this spin sense. Okay? So even questions like what is the ground state? This type of questions is often an open problem sometimes. Depends on the spin chains. But for some spin chains, we don't even have a description of what is the state with the lowest energy of this big exponential matrix. Sometimes we do. So this is one comment I would like to make. So just to tell you that a priori, without telling you more, you, you should rightfully be worried that this could be complicated. And the, the, the second thing I want to say is that some spin chains are exactly solvable. So this is great because it means that even though it was an exponentially big matrix, we can compute its spectrum analytically for some of them. So for example, you remember I gave you an example here and I said what matters for example is this lambda, this ratio here, right? What matters is the ratio. So for example, if B is equal to minus C, it's a particular spin chain, this H is solvable. This, this one just, uh, for spin one half, sorry, let me just finish it. This one for spin one half is solvable. I forgot to say, this is the simplest one. So the simplest one is solvable. The spin one is not solvable, except if B is equal to minus C. 
If B is equal to minus C, then it is solvable. Okay. Just to yes, say, uh, you have uh, uh, 10 minutes and then 10 more minutes uh, for questions. So just to, to, yeah. to say. Okay. Sure. Any questions? Okay. What is so, the notion of solvable we're using? Is it a practical one or just, or is there something more rigorous here? So solvable here means we can plot the energy levels. We can compute the various energy levels. We can solvable in the usual sense that the harmonic oscillator is solvable. But we can compute. So, so some of them are solvable and that means many things as you say. So the first thing in particular, it means we can compute the energy of the ground state and we can compute the energy of the first excited state and the energy of the second, etc. That would be one thing about solvable. Now, the, all this, it becomes harder and harder and harder, but it's not even the hardest type of question you could ask. What would be another type of question you could ask? You could say, suppose I start, I have my ground state and I have my ground state. And I want in my ground state to compute, for example, expectation value, the correlation function. How does the spin at some position N interact with some spin, some average in some position separated N plus K? This would be in my spin chain, even if I have in the vacuum, how do two spins far away interact with each other? This would be correlation functions. This is harder, but can also be done and so on. So solvable means you, you can compute things. Now, in this remaining than 10 minutes, let's go uh, so I, one more comment that I, I want to make, and you can ask me more in, in, in the context of uh, in the questions, is that spin chains show up not only in condensed matter, but also in high energy physics. For example, in ADS-CFT. So it turns out that non-abelian gauge theories always give rise to spin chains. And uh, when, if you have a non-abelian gauge theory, you, get a spin, you have a spin chain problem that you would like to solve. So each non-abelian gauge theory, the claim is that any large, large and if this is not familiar what this means, forget about it, but any non-abelian gauge theory produces for you a spin chain. And so spin chains are fundamental quantum mechanical problems that show up in material science, but also in high energy physics, like holography and ADS-CFT and so on. So, so having said that, let's ask, let's go then to the simplest spin chain. Maybe before this, let me just make a comment here. For example, you might have heard, right? So you might have heard of a duality between n equals four super young Mills being dual to string theory in ADS five times S five. Right? You might have you might have heard this that there is such duality. What is the symmetry of a five sphere? Well, the symmetry of a two sphere is SO three rotation, right? The symmetry of a four of a five sphere is SO six. So, for example, a spin chain that shows up in n equals four is exactly this type of spin chain that I said with n equal to six which is that this will be related to the symmetry of the five sphere. So this is this parenthesis that, for example, for n equal to six, such chains 
show up in ADS-CFT. So it's an example of an application, right? In condensed matter, you probably don't find SO6 pin chains, but you find them in ADS-CFT. But in condensed matter, the one that you definitely find is this simplest spin chain H that is lambda times the sum of spin at position I dotted with spin at position I plus one. And this Hamiltonian, I see that there is a question. I just want to finish these arrows and then I'll take this question. We should now distinguish in this simplest Hamiltonian. We want to study this Hamiltonian. Let's distinguish between two important cases lambda positive and lambda negative. But before I go on, let me, uh, Ivan has a question. You are muted. No, I think you are still muted, right? Can people hear Ivan? Yes, uh, yes, I cannot hear. Ivan, I think you are still muted. I have five minutes or am I? Okay, Ivan cannot ask his question. Now. Uh, I can you can you hear me? Now yes. Oh, sorry, just the question was uh um where does the discreteness of of spin chains come from when like in these sort of dualities, like from gauge symmetry, which seems like a very continuous quantum field theory thing? How do we arrive to such a discrete uh Sort of thing such as a spin chain. Uh, ask me that in the question. Uh, it's an excellent question, but uh, this is just uh, that would bring me that would send me to this point, and I want to go to this point. Perfect. So okay. it's an excellent question. Let, let's ask me the question. How many do I have? Three minutes to just make a few comments about this, or should I? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Oh, I can also answer. finish here, and I you can ask me in the questions if you want about the simple spin chain. Well, let, let me continue a little bit more for three minutes. So if lambda is positive, right? I remind you the Hamiltonian is this. It means the spins want to be aligned. Sorry. No, they want to be anti-aligned. If lambda is negative, they want to be aligned, right? If all the spins are aligned, this is maximum, then uh, this is okay if lambda is negative. So lambda is positive. Naively, we say spins like to anti-align. In other words, they like to form a singlet. If lambda is negative, to lower the energy, the spins like to align. Now, this is a huge difference. It's huge, 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 because Aligned spins, it's trivial, right? Aligned spins is just, just mean that the vacuum, the ground state, is what? Is, for example, spin up at the first position, spin up at the second position, spin up at the third position, etc. It's just spin up everyone. Right? So everyone up would be what would have the lowest energy when lambda is negative. This is called the ferromagnetic vacuum. What if they want to anti-align? If they want to anti-align, classically, you would say it's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And that is what is called the nil state. The nil state is not the vacuum. Because up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down is the classical state. Quantum mechanically, if you act with Hamiltonian on up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, you don't diagonalize the Hamiltonian. You just, uh, so the nil state, so here, this would be classically, it would be the state that would be the ground state, would be the nil state, which is just up, down, up, down, up, down. Up, down, etc. But quantum mechanically, what you want is you take two spins and you form a singlet. Take next two spins, form a singlet. So you are forming some kind of singlet out of all the spins. Now, there are many singlets, right? 
If I have spin one half, 10 spins one half, there are many ways of constructing a singlet out of these spins. And so the ground state here is a complicated singlet. So here, the ground state would be, for example, up, down, up, down, et cetera, plus up, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, plus, et cetera. And it would be a huge linear combination of states forming a singlet. Now, you see that the first state, this ferromagnetic vacuum, is trivial to write down. The antiferromagnetic vacuum, it's not. And indeed, we don't know how to write it down. We just know it's a big singlet state. But let me make a few comments about the different physics between the two. So first, the ferromagnetic vacuum, there is no entanglement in the sense that you can really say the first n spins are down, and then the remaining l minus n spins are down. You can really write your quantum state as whatever happens in the first piece of the chain times what happened in the second piece, right? It factorizes, right? Because everyone is up. So you can say it's up this piece times up this other piece. In the antiferromagnetic state, you cannot say that this state is some piece times some other piece. It's a linear combination. So it's really a quantum state. So here, this, there is, it's a, very quantum entangled state, first of all. Whereas here, there is no entanglement. And when you say the speed, and one more very important difference is that if you have a singlet, right? It's like a, it's like a scalar. You did not choose any direction so you did not break SU2. So here, this preserves the rotation symmetry, SU2 symmetry. SU2 is the same as SU3. It preserves the rotation symmetry. It's a singlet. It doesn't have any direction. Whereas this one, this state here, this where all spins are up, breaks the symmetry. So that this one is like a magnet this ferromagnetic magnet, where the, mag the spins are pointing in some direction. It breaks rotation symmetry. Whereas this is the anti-ferromagnetic, and it doesn't break any symmetry. So what's the statement? The statement that the spins can point up, but they can point down, that has the same energy, or they can point in the x direction. All of them have the same energy. And by choosing one vacuum, you are breaking the symmetry. So this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is a very important concept in physics. So the symmetry is spontaneously broken and you choose, you pick one direction and that can be your vacuum. And so the spectrum of, uh, of this Hamiltonian, if I plot the energies, what do I have? Depending on the sign of lambda, I have, a ferromagnetic state, and then an antiferromagnetic state. So those would be the extremes. They would be the ground states depending on the sign of lambda. And here it will be the antiferro. So this one has spin zero. This one has spin L over two, each spin counts one half and it has maximum spin, right? Then what can I do? I have all spins up, they are all L over two. And now I can say one of them flip it. So don't consider all up, consider all up except one. Okay? And now what you have, you start having energies which are ferromagnetic plus excitations. And these are like some spin flips. You say that now, instead of everyone being up, you have everyone up, but you flip one of them or you flip another one later. And so these are what are called excitations or spin flips. They are also called magnons, like magnetic particles, it's magnets. 
And then you would have a bunch of, of these states, these excited states. This would be how we would describe excited states starting from the ferromagnetic state. And then you have excitations around the antiferromagnetic state. So this would be the antiferromagnetic, the one that doesn't break the symmetry, plus excitation. The excitations here, they are different. Instead of magnets, they are called spinons. And there is a remarkable thing about these spinons. They exhibit a phenomenon. I will just write it down. And then in the questions, if people want to ask, they exhibit a phenomenon of fractionalization. This phenomenon is, is the fact that these excitations, you see that each state here, the states, they always differ. The total spin, delta spin, is always an integer, always. So delta spin is always an integer. Why? Because if I have some spin, what I can do is, for example, flip one spin. So then I go from plus one half to minus one half. Then it's one, the difference, right? Or I flip two. Then I go from, I get two flips, so the delta spin would be two. So any change in the Hilbert space, by definition, because the Hilbert space is only up plus one half or minus one half, by definition, the difference of spins in the Hilbert space is always integer. Do you agree? And you have a multiple of one half, then you flip one of the signs one half, you get a shift by one. It turns out, and this is totally amazing, that these states, these guys, they have spin one half. Totally strange. These ones, these magnets, they have spin one as they should. You see, I go from up to down, the difference is one. So there's no mystery. It's spin one as it should. This antiferromagnet, they have spin one half. And here, these guys would merge, and this would be the full description of this spin. And uh, so this is just the simplest possible spin chain. And uh, even for the simplest possible spin chain, this picture can only be constructed because we can actually solve exactly this spin chain. But then there are other spin chains where the vacuum can be very rich and exhibit uh, lots of other different uh, physics. But uh, I, I think I'll stop here and uh, stop for questions. I, I hope this gave you a flavor of the richness of these uh, spin chains. But um, I think it's probably a good point to, to stop. Thank you, Professor Pedro. So we have some questions in the chat and Ivan also has a question. I don't know if Ivan wants to ask now. Uh, 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 sure. Should I ask now or should I wait? Go on, go on. Um, so so ju yeah, just that question of, of, of how does the, how does, how does this one go from this continuous okay. field theory or like to, to, to this discreteness? Yes. Okay, so it's, it's nothing very deep. It's just the fact that when we are dealing with a non-abelian gauge theory, you can maybe mute yourself. There is some feedback mark. Oh, sorry. When we deal with non-abelian gauge theory, what this non-abelian means, the non-abelian, just means that the fields don't commute. The fields are matrices, right? Like our fields are matrices, that's why they don't commute. So for example, we could have a field theory, example. Imagine I have a field phi one, which is a matrix, A, B, and the field phi two, which is a matrix AB, such that, so this will be an example of a gauge theory coupled with two scalar fields, such that under gauge transformations, under gauge transformations, this field, this matrices would be conjugated. 
phi u phi u minus and with a continuous gauge transformation like you are saying then uh, what are the objects that we construct in a field theory we multiply fields we construct products of fields right but now because they are matrices the order matters how we multiply them so an operator in my field theory a field in my field theory or an operator would be equal to multiplying these fields by one but the order matters i would do phi one times phi one times phi one times phi two times phi one times phi two etc now this product of fields is an example i multiply many fields and what happens when we multiply fields is that there's something nice happening is that now this object is becoming more gauge invariant because when I transform this guy picks up a u and a u minus one this guy picks up a u and a u minus one and we start seeing that these guys cancel and I start to get something that is gauge invariant but I'm only delaying the problem the problem is at the very end at the very end I have the same non gauge invariant that I had before so how do I make it really gauge invariant I compute the trace of this product of fields. Now it's I have a total gauge invariant object. So this trace is a cyclic object. It means I can rotate the fields. I can take this last field phi and remove it all the way and bring it to the beginning of the trace, right? I have this cyclic, the trace is cyclic. Trace of A, B, C, I can move C to the beginning, right? And so this picture, I can say that this operator if I think of spin of, of field one as a spin up, I can think that this is like up, up, up. Then I think of this guy as down, down, then up, then down, etc. Then at the end I have up. And so automatically, and in an abelian gauge theory, the, the fields, the, the objects of my theory are in one-to-one -one correspondence to states in the Hilbert space of a quantum spin chain. So the statement is that so in any so given uh, a non-abelian gauge theory, we have that the operators in the field theory are in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements of the Hilbert space of a spin chain. Now, this is still far, this is still not yet a spin chain, because what's a spin chain is I have this Hilbert space and I have locality. The Hamiltonian acts on neighboring spins. It doesn't act on spin one, coupling it with spin 22. So then there is an extra element, which is locality of my spin chain is mapped to something important in the field theory, but uh, I'm okay, that would, uh, let me not discuss this. But if people want, I can, I can, I can tell you what it is. But uh, the punchline is that at the end, uh, given a non-abelian gauge theory, you do get a local spin chain. Uh, there are two questions at the chat. I don't know if Carlos Augusto wants to open his mic and, and ask, or do you want me to read it? So he asks, uh, may we understand this kind of system by a thermodynamic point of view? So thermodynamics is the limit when the number of spins is very large. So when the number of spins is very large, naively the matrix becomes, it was hard when the spin is 12, when the spin is infinity, it's even harder, no, no. Now, of course, sometimes things simplify the thermodynamic limit, all right? And so there are sometimes approximations that you can do in the thermodynamic limit that you cannot do in the discrete case. So if the question is, are there sometimes simplifications that come about when the spin chain is very large? The answer is yes. So, so but I mean, it's a huge topic. I mean, uh, one could, uh, what would be the relevant questions to ask in about thermodynamics? For example, we could say that I want to compute the partition function of the spin chain, which would be the summation of e to the minus beta times the spin chain Hamiltonian. 
right? The summation over the energy level with some fixed temperature, right? And so this is a question you could ask. And if the length goes to infinity, this is expected to become e to the minus the length, right? An extensive quantity times the free energy per unit length that depends only on beta. And so you could ask, can I compute this free energy? And when I said that some spin chains are solvable, oops. So the answer is we can compute them if it's solvable or if we have some, sometimes we can make some approximations for trying to compute this quantum spin chain. So one thing you could imagine, for example, that sometimes happens. So this is one answer about thermodynamics. There is another thing that can happen in thermodynamics is that you can imagine a system where you have a bunch of spins and you can imagine that the spins are changing very slowly. So it's like, and now that it changes very slowly, there is some kind of description in terms of a slow moving field that tells you how the spins change very slowly. So you could imagine that you have these discrete spin chains, so it's a discrete nature, right? So this side one, side two, side three, side four. But if you zoom out and if you look from far away, you don't see the spins, right? You can imagine seeing a line. And then you have some magnetization that is changing smoothly along that line. And you just measure some coarse grain quantity. Like what's the average magnetization in 100 spins, say. And that varies, could vary slowly along the spin chain. So you could have a, a long wavelength spin waves. And they could have a simpler description again because it's some effective description when the spin when the wavelength is big, and indeed that often happens. So this the two corners where sometimes we do have simplification. Uh, so, <clears throat> are more questions here? I see someone. Yeah, I think you can just unmute yourself. Yeah? Um, so. Maybe we just, uh, so there are two more questions, uh, one in the chat yeah. and, and one raised hand. So just, let's just make uh, and uh, take these two questions and then uh, uh, go to the lunch because, uh, okay. Um, so there's this question in the chat from João Victor Rebosos. I don't know if he wants to open his mic or you want me to read it. Uh, so, so I'm going to read it. Uh, what happens if you couple different spins in the chain? For instance, could you have an alternating SU2 chain of spins S equals one half and S equal, equals one, or even alternating chain of SU2 and SU3 cells, or maybe a chain defect, for instance, SU2J equal one half chain with J, one J1 one spin uh, somewhere. Can some of those systems be analytically solved? <clears throat> right, so that's an, uh, a nice question. So can we have a spin chain where, for example, the spins would alternate? There will be some representations, for example, some representation at the odd side, some representation at the even side. So not only we can have, but often in condensed matter, this would be realized, right? I can have a molecule that goes up and down. And when it's up, it's one type of spin. When it's down, it's another type of spin. And it goes up and down, right? And it goes up and there is one... Um, how do you say, an element of a big molecule. What's the name of a monomer? One monomer that would have some spin one half and then the next monomer would have spin one and then the one would have spin one half, right? This could very well be, you can imagine, right? In chemistry, something like that. And then it would have some spin one half, some spin one, some spin one half, some spin one, some spin one half, some spin one, et cetera. What would be a local spin chain? Now here I would have a sum of CJ times projector J, but now J can be one half or three halves, for example, in this case, right? But I, I add up two spins and now I can have one half or three halves, right? So the answer is yes, you can definitely have these alternating spin chains. They do show up in condensed matter, obviously. And they show up also in ADS-CFT. So I gave you an example of ADS-CFT, these strings in ADS-5 times S5. They show up, for example, in strings if it is ADS4 times CP3, you get this alternating spin chains, for example. So it's true. 
Okay. Uh, João, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? So the last question. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, you you mentioned that to have the correspondence between non-abelian gauge theories with spin chains, you you put a parenthesis there where you wrote large n. Right. Do you have to have large n to to have this correspondence or? Right. So what I did not say here is that large n is what gives you locality. Oh. So this thing that I did not say is large n. So what happens is that, um, so uh, okay, let me just say a few, just one word about it. So imagine I have a bunch of particles propagating. And now you can, they can, they are charged. So they can throw photons at each other, right? So that would be like the electron picture. Now, when particles are non-abelian, the correct picture is like this, lines that are being exchanged, they are not photons, but gluons. And gluons have two indices. So if we want to draw a gluon, we should draw a double line that indicates the two indices of the gluon. Okay? And now we have this, two indices, and this is a gluon. Could be a gluon. And now this guy could be a quark, for example. Instead of an electron. Now, when gluons have two indices, now it turns out that there are things that you can do, which is that now you can, uh, in an non-abelian gauge theory, you can swap, you can, now you, have, you start having diagrams like where the particles, they start having two lines. For example, I can have two gluons propagating and they themselves can exchange gluons. And now they can exchange another gluon. So this picture would represent now two particles going and exchanging two particles. And the last one does nothing here. And another picture you could have is one where the three particles are here. And now they could, let me erase a little bit, oops, a bit too much, but they could exchange the gluons and then it couples here. And so what happens is the following, is that you see that there is a difference between these two diagrams, this one versus, oops, this one versus this one, which is that this one I can draw without lifting my pen. It's what's called a planar diagram. And these ones I needed to put to, to lift my pen to say that the glue one goes behind. So this one is non-planar, the, the, this one is non-planar, and this one is planar. And what happens at planar graphs, you see you get a loop here. You can get, you start getting loops. And this loop, if the indices of the matrix are N, this loop gives you a factor of N. And then they have less loops. And so non-abelian gauge theories, when N is large, when the number of colors is large, they, this guy, forces planarity. So interactions that you need to draw things like this, that they, they go below the lines, these are suppressed in an abelian gauge theories with large number of colors. And so just because the large number of colors, things need to happen without lifting the pen, you gain immediately this locality that this guy can interact with this guy, but not with the next one. Right? And therefore, you can immediately get this interaction between i and i plus 1. And so locality in the spin chain, therefore, will come directly just from the gauge theory having large n. So large n in the gauge theory means that there is some, some local interaction, that the diagrams that go far away, they are suppressed together with diagrams that have local structure. And this means that in the spin chain, then the interactions will become local. And so that's how we see that um, what if it is n is not large? That would just mean that you would have a spin chain where you will start having long range interactions, which also show up in condensed matter. You can sometimes have some molecules and there are some short range interactions, but also some long range interactions. And it could also happen. You could also have both. Right? And, uh... Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you once again, Professor. Uh, 
was a was a great great presentation. Uh, so if people want to ask more questions, maybe you can leave the this on and people can ask more questions. While the but officially you can go for lunch or um, yeah yeah. Uh, let me remind that uh, all this all the discussions can be carried to the Slack. Uh, there's a Slack channel specifically for this presentation, so everyone that wants to ask more questions, but please do go people there, really actually. use the Slack? I doubt people use the Slack. Oh, well, uh, actually, we're okay. using it quite quite effectively yeah, in this yeah, uh, event. So if you want to enter, prefer, then I, I would still prefer if people ask questions now. I mean, I prefer to stay a little bit longer, and if people ask questions, and uh, people can go for lunch, but those that want to ask questions can can stay. Uh, otherwise, I will forget to see the Slack. I think. Or someone should remind me to check the Slack if, if you are going to use the Slack. Well, um, oh, maybe maybe everyone can go there now. We are, now we're, we're going to, to, we have to test the next presentations here. So. Ah, because we are starting right there. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. So, so everyone goes uh, to the Slack channel around. now and keep the discussion. Thank you, Professor. Ah, thank you. See you. See you.